book, at least the title is fascinating. I haven't read it yet, but Olmstead and Yosemite, Civil War, Abolition, and the National Park Idea. We're honored to have both of the co-authors with us today to talk about the book. Um, they've told me that they will run about a half hour or so, so we've left plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. Just remind everyone to please mute. Um, when it comes time for questions, you can either unmute yourself or you can put something into the chat box. But with that, I will go ahead and introduce um, the speakers um, and then we'll get started. Um, Rolf Diamant was superintendent of five national parks, including Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site and Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park now an adjunct associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Vermont. He is, uh, uh, he is co-editor and contributing author of A Thinking Person's Guide to America's National Parks and writes a column on the challenges facing national parks that regularly appears in the Parks Stewardship Forum, a journal of the University of California, Berkeley, and the George Wright Society. And we also have Ethan Carr, who is a professor of landscape architecture and the director of the Masters of Landscape Architecture program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is a landscape historian and preservationist specializing in public landscapes. Three of his award-winning books, Wilderness by Design, Mission 66, Modernism and the National Park Dilemma, <clears throat> and The Greatest Beach, a history of the Cape Cod National Seashore described the 20th century History of Planning and Design in the U.S. National Park System as a Context for Considering Its Future. Carr was the lead editor for the early Boston years, 1882 to 1890, volume eight of the papers of Frederick Law Olmsted. His latest book, Boston's Franklin Park, Olmsted Recreation in the Modern City, um, to be published in 2023. And Carr consults with landscape architecture firms um, developing plans and designs for historic parks of all types. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Rolf. Uh, thank, thanks, Steve. Uh, and thanks for inviting us and setting up this conversation. Let me share my screen. I think we're in business. Yes, right up. Looks good. good. Great. Uh, I think it's a good idea to point out, uh, given our audience today, that we began this project, in fact, with a National Park Service historic resource study on the Olmsteads and the National Park Service with our co-author, Lauren Meyer. Uh, that was done under the uh, an NPS cooperative agreement with the Organization of American Historians. Our new book, Olmsted and Yosemite, Civil War Abolition and the National Park Idea, in fact, grew out of this HRS. And it is, it, it's intended to be a timely reinterpretation of the origins of national parks in the United States. So where did this idea for creating a system of national parks really actually come from? We are all aware of the popular stories rooted in myths and misconceptions. Uh, many Americans still believe the national park idea arose uh, during, uh, spontaneously during the campfire conversation on the Yellowstone Plateau in 1870. Uh, that was the official story for many years. Others believe that Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir came up with the idea while sitting around their famous Yosemite Valley uh, campfire in 1903, uh, though their conversation likely centered um, on reuniting the valley with the larger national park around it. So why w w are we taking this afternoon to talk about Frederick Law Olmsted? You know, wasn't he just a city park designer? What did he have to do with national parks? Perhaps the question we should be asking, though, is how did the institution of public parks gain such a prominent place in our national imagination and identity. And to start, perhaps the, the, the very concept, the very term national park idea, which is in our title, might be in fact a bit misleading because what Ethan and I are really talking about here is the public park idea as it took shape in the mid 19th century. 
Uh, this was before and during the U.S. Civil War, which was the most traumatic and transformative uh, event in American history. Indeed, it was the broader idea of public parks that was the source of the national park idea, if we choose to consider it even as a separate idea at all. And it was uh, uh, during this period uh, that uh, we discovered, a, 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 looking at this period, discovered a letter from uh, Sarah Shaw written to Frederick Law Olmsted in 1861, only four months after the Civil War had begun. Um, um, Shaw was a social reform abolitionist and the mother of Robert Gould Shaw, the future commander of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. The younger Shaw would die, of course, with more than 100 black soldiers at Fort Wagner several years later. But in her letter, 1861 letter, Sarah Shaw made a remarkably prescient association between emancipation, government reform, and the creation of great public parks. These words of Shaw in her letter to Olmsted became, in fact, the starting point for our book. And I'll quote, if we can remake the government, abolish slavery, and get Central Park well underway for our descendants, we shall have done a work worthy of the 19th century. Shaw's letter was written when putting down the rebellion and reestablishing the union were paramount objectives. She, however, framed the conflict as an opportunity to reinvent the nation and replace a political system that had long sanctioned slavery. Her choice of words to remake the government implied that her goal was not the restoration of the old federal union as it was, but its replacement with something better. Her vision was also associated with the creation of a great public park, an achievement or in fact representative of the kind of civic progress that she wished for the whole country. These accomplishments were in fact interdependent and together represented for Shaw her highest ambitions for 19th century America. Best known today as a landscape architect and co-designer of Central Park, Frederick Law Olmsted was a well-traveled chronicler of antebellum Southern society and slavery, and would serve the Union during the Civil War as executive director of the United States Sanitary Commission, providing medical aid to wounded soldiers. In 1865, he would go on to write a report intended to guide the future management of Yosemite Valley as a public park. His strong views on human improvement, particularly his steadfast antagonism towards slavery, were his guiding Northern Star. In dispatches back to the New York Times on his journeys through the South, he declared slavery to be, quote, the greatest sin and shame upon any nation and people on God's earth. And it was the duty, quote, of every man in the world to oppose slavery, to weaken it, to destroy it. In his opinion, there was no greater impediment to the nation's progress. The title of Olmsted's well-known book, Cotton Kingdom, which is uh, on image on the left, was in fact an ironic reference to the words of South Carolina Senator James Hammond, who had infamously declared on, on the floor of the U.S. Senate that the absolute economic power of cotton could, quote, bring the whole world to our feet. That power was exercised before the Civil War when pro-slavery politicians in Washington blocked land grants for education, transportation, and homesteading. They were content with a relatively weak central government with limited responsibility, delivering the U.S. mail, protecting settlers on the frontier, and pursuing fugitive slaves. They, in fact, preferred financing that government through the sale of public lands in lieu of public taxation, thus avoiding taxes on the enormous wealth accumulated through enslaved labor. 
by its second year, the Civil War had become, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, a remorseless and revolutionary struggle. Hundreds of thousands of enslaved people self-emancipated, seeking freedom and sanctuary behind Union lines. Black resistance and self-emancipation in large numbers would hollow out the Confederacy and place enormous pressure on the Lincoln administration to, in fact, codify emancipation. Once Republicans enjoyed an absolute majority in Congress, it became clear that there would be no negotiated settlement that would return the United States to its pre-war status quo, and changes began to happen quickly. This reality, in fact, led to an extraordinary expansion of the scope and duties of the national government, fundamentally remaking the republic. Congress and the Lincoln administration sought to build a more activist republic, focused on improvements that served large constituencies. When in the period of just five months from March to July of 1862, legislation passed for a national banking and revenue system, a new Department of Agriculture, and land grants for public education, transportation, and homesteading. The capstone to what has been called the Second American Revolution was congressional authorization for the recruitment of black soldiers into the United States Army, followed by Lincoln's release of a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Now, taken as a whole, these measures affirm the efficacy and value of Republican government and the necessity of defending it. In 1864, when Congress granted Yosemite Valley to the state of California to create a public park, it did so as Olmsted declared, quote, in trust for the whole nation. The act was another land grant, a modest but eventually consequential part of the wave of federal wartime legislation that was passed not in spite of the war, but because of the war. Now, for many years, historians have been at a loss to really explain the Yosemite Act, considering its wartime passage as an unexplained anomaly, a great mystery. They could not comprehend why Congress would take time out to deal with Yosemite, given the national emergency of the war. Quite to the contrary, we place the Yosemite Act squarely in this larger framework of wartime legislative and constitutional reform. In fact, as Lincoln believed, if an insurrection could interfere with the functioning and continuity of constitutional government, quote, it might fairly claim to have already conquered and ruined us. When Olmsted was asked to draft a report on the management of Yosemite Valley as a public park, he used the opportunity to explain the meaning and significance of the park and its wider global context. The act drew its inspiration, of course, from New York Central Park, which demonstrated the ability of a republic to meet the demands of a large number of its citizens. Ethan will address this in greater detail. At a time when Republican government was assailed by monarchists in Europe and violently rejected, of course, by secessionists in the United States, Central Park and Yosemite represented an embodiment of Republican ideals during the nation's greatest political and social crisis. Ethan and I respectfully suggest that the justification of outstanding universal value for Central Park's inclusion on the current U.S. World Heritage tentative list, shown on the left, be expanded to recognize the historical appoint, uh, uh, importance of this emerging public park ideology and the critical role of Republican government at both Central Park and Yosemite in the context of a global struggle between democratic ideals and aristocratic privilege. In his Yosemite report, in fact, Olmsted addressed both the new world and the old world when he presciently warned against the private monopolization of scenic landscapes 
and argued for the equitable access to recreational opportunities presented by these great parks. In, in the 1865 report, uh, it also provided Olmsted with a singular platform to share his aspirational vision for a reconstructed post-war nation where great public parks could become in, in keystone institutions of an emancipated and restored American Republic. In the report, Olmsted affirmed every person's entitlement to enjoy the nation's most spectacular landscapes. And in that process, he framed the intellectual foundation for a system of national parks, declaring the establishment by government of great public grounds for the free enjoyment of the people is thus justified as a political duty. He believed that government had a compelling obligation, in fact, to support these great parks on an equal footing with all its other major duties. And no, this goal was not realized for all people, not for the people who were displaced from their homes and not for many who found parks either too distant or who were discriminated against when they tried to use them. Indigenous peoples were never included among the beneficiaries of Lincoln's new birth of freedom, as they were forced out of their ancestral lands repurposed to expedite Republican land policies. Early writers who describe Yosemite Valley as untrammeled wild nature willfully overlook generations, countless generations of human occupation. Tragically, the Miwok people who made Yosemite Valley their home for thousands of years suffered violence and dispossession when the valley was invaded by California militiamen in 1851 and incorporated into the public domain more than a decade prior to the park's creation. As we acknowledge the significance of the Yosemite report, we continue to acknowledge the enduring connection indigenous people have with Yosemite and all other national parks, and recognize the importance of presenting all aspects of this complicated history. And finally, the authorization of Yellowstone National Park in 1872, seven years after the end of the Civil War, was also concurrent with this rising tide of federal authority, a byproduct of the Civil War. This rising tide was further strengthened by federal efforts to enforce Southern Reconstruction and the adoption of the 14th and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution. Our book, in fact, makes the case that if the Yosemite Grant had been proposed just a few years earlier, in a pre-war Congress, while the country was still held back by slavery and its small government ideology, the park in Yosemite would have no doubt shared the same fate as other blocked Republican initiatives. Finally, without a union victory, aided by the mobilization of nearly 200,000 black soldiers, legislation for Yosemite, the template for Yellowstone, and the early national parks that followed might never have been enacted. Over to you, Ethan. All right, thank you, Rolf. Uh, you can advance the slides, I guess. I'm gonna be cueing Rolf to advance the slides here. Um, I feel like I'm lecturing at UMass because everybody has their camera off and, are, and they're muted. So I don't, I don't really know if they're there, but uh, um, I think we are allowed to unmute ourselves and ask questions and I'll try to be brief so that we can get to discussion. I see there are people here uh, in the meeting that I know, uh, and I'd love to hear from you or hear from anyone for that matter. Um, so I'll try to I'll try to uh, uh, be as brief as I can. Um, Rolf's outlining how during this tumultuous period, the the park idea becomes a new public institution as the republic is made through civil war and reconstruction and constitutional amendments and so on. And I and I guess I'm here to talk about the other part of this. It's not just happening in the Sierra Nevada. It's happening in the middle of Manhattan as well. 
because uh, both of these places are becoming public parks uh, um, at this time in dramatically different settings. I realize, I think Rolf and I have been talking about this most of our professional lives. We realize how, how difficult it can be to compare these two places because they are so different in terms of their setting, dramatically different. But what we also like to talk about is what they have in common. Um, and that's important in understanding where how the national park idea could actually be part of a larger idea, which is the American public park idea. And that's how we understand better how uh, national parks have become so central to, let's say, the American imagination or, or our sort of public consciousness. And that's because they're one of these major, uh, the whole idea of parks is one of the major institutions that's coming out of all of the tumult. tumult of the Civil War years. So what do they have in common? Um, not their setting, perhaps, but their purpose, um, as it was described and understood there uh, then. Um, both um, are really dedicated to the idea that um, experiences of what would be called at the time landscape beauty uh, were essential rights, were essential to human happiness. Um, uh, those experiences were essential to the well-being of people uh, and therefore of society. And so a society that failed to assure that people could have these experiences was a failure, which is exactly what the Southerners were saying. You know, the American Republic is a failure, exactly as Rolf was alluding to, the monarchists were saying in Europe when they put down the revolutions of 1848, you know, you can't have a Republican government. It can't take care of its citizens. You need some form of autocracy. Um, uh, and so the idea, it was a powerful rhetoric, in other words, this idea that that um, these places were necessary to well-being and a government that failed to make sure they were available to all of its citizens was a failure. Now, obviously, we're not really talking about all of the citizens of the Republic in 1864, 1865. Slavery still exists. Uh, uh, as, as Rolf was alluding to, uh, indigenous peoples are being dispossessed to make at least the Western national parks. Um, Black Americans were, were dislocated to make Central Park. Um, so it's not everyone. It is an aspiration where we're, we're, we acknowledge that, I think, pretty thoroughly. Um, but the idea that everyone needed to have these experiences and only public parks could assure that would happen because otherwise only the elite, the very rich, uh, would have these ex would would they they would basically monopolize these experience through own private ownership, uh, and so that's a very powerful purpose that is um, uh, uh, not just about national parks but but about um, uh, 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 new urban parks, especially large parks that are being created um, at this time. And secondly, I think they share meanings. And that's where the context that Rolf is uh, um, explaining so well um, uh, is important. What, what do these places mean in the context of the American Republic as it's going through its greatest crisis? Um, this idea that they embody um, some, not just public health and well being, and the uh, commitment by a Republican government to assure that people can lead fulfilled lives and be healthy. Um, uh, but there's also a real political meaning here. Um, it, they, they're, they're embodying what the remade republic uh, can be in a better form. Uh, it's still imperfect, but uh, it would not have enslaved people. It would be unified. It would be uh, um, everything the Republican Party and Lincoln uh, was saying it could be um, as the Civil War ground on. Uh, and a lot of institutions come out of this period, if you think about it, you know, museums and universities and newspapers and magazines, all sorts of public institutions that have names like the New Republic and, and uh, <laughs> names like that. Um, uh, and, and the public park is one of them. And I think that does help explain how the public park has be, remains such an important feature of, of sort of American identity or identities. Um, and it's not something that is has remained stable, but it has something that um, has continued to evolve. Um, but, but if we see it coming out of all of this conflict and all the political context, Rolf was talking about, it helps explain why it's it's so important um, um, to this day. Um, Rolf, next slide. Yes, this was just more of this, so we can just go on to the next one as well. So um, uh, in terms of its political meaning, 
we should remember that uh, Southerners like to say, oh, your cities are worse than our plantations, right? This was a common argument against uh, uh, the North that American cities in the North had become so unhealthful and so horrible and that um, uh, in fact, uh, immigrants were le le leading worse lives than enslaved people. And this was a pretty bad thing to say <laughs> uh, uh, in general, I think we can recognize. But when we look at images like these of Central Park, um, uh, these were direct rebuttals. An image like this was a direct rebuttal to that kind of argument. Look at what an American city in the North can do. Look how it's taking care of its citizens. It's not, it's not only providing them uh, with with essential amenities like water and parks and and, and others eventually sewers and police if they get to it, um, uh, but it's also just an image um, uh, that is a direct rebuttal uh, to that kind of argument, uh, and and I think that uh, you know Yosemite Valley to some degree became that for the entire country, the way Central Park did for the American city. Um, th this idea that the northern vision of the future, which was industrialized, urban, all of those things, um, was was tenable. It was ethical. It was even beautiful. Um, uh, and the idea that the American Republic, um, as it was unified and as it faced um, uh, all of the trends that would affect it in the future, um, uh, uh, would be beautiful, as well as um, uh, at least to some degree more just. Um, and and uh, more healthful than Southern propaganda would have it. So if you look at it that way, you understand why someone like Calvert Vox said Central Park was the great artwork of the Republic. I mean, what did that really mean? Um, you know, it was, it was an affirmation of, uh, uh, of self-government um, as the Atlantic Monthly quote here uh, also is suggesting. Um, and, and Olmsted made similar remarks, you know, uh, the most significant uh, uh, monument to democratic ways of government and, 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 that, and that kind of, uh, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but, but that kind of statement, it's a vindication of self-government of the future of the republic as a unified republic uh, that would be able to meet the needs of its citizens. Um, and, and so there's really important meaning as well as purpose that is being shared across the country, across scales, across uh, in very different settings that we can say the American public park is taking on in terms of its ideology, the rhetoric, and the political justifications. And why should government make parks? We forget this sometimes, but the only reason government should make parks, at least in the 19th century, one and one might argue today, is that they're necessary for human well-being. It's the same reasons governments make roads and Governments supply clean water and sewers uh, and security because they are necessary and private sector cannot do it. Um, that's why government is justified in creating parks. Um, that that parks seem to always be in danger of falling out of the category of necessary public infrastructure. Um, uh, but but nevertheless, that's the assertion that's being made that 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 they in fact are. And by the way, that also helps on. Um, the whole question of dispossession, which Rolf was already bringing up, the people who are being dispossessed to make Central Park, uh, Seneca Village, many, many of you probably know about that, or the uh, indigenous groups that were forcibly displaced at, at Yosemite Valley. What justifies the use of eminent domain in a place like Central Park? Public interest, however the public is being defined, however the interest is being defined. But if it's infrastructure that's necessary, uh, eminent domain is justified, and that's uh, exactly uh, the category that Central Park fell in. Um, it doesn't justify the, um, uh, you know, un uh, um, dispossession of indigenous peoples across the continent. But when you get right down to it, the dispossession of people across the continent was happening anyway, um, and 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 uh, national parks were only part of that, uh, as symbolic a part as they may have been. Okay, next slide, Rolf. Uh, and I'd also like to point out that this uh, uh, th this idea that these kinds of experiences are actually necessary to human well-being was expressed in aesthetic terms by Olmsted in 1865, and indeed by his contemporaries. So Olmsted would talk about landscape beauty and the and the need to experience different types of landscape and landscape beauty, and that's why you created a place like Central Park, and that's why you set aside a place like Yosemite Valley. At Central Park, you had to do a lot. <laughs> 
in order to get those experiences in a small place that, that wouldn't otherwise exhibit them. At Yosemite, you actually wanted to do as little as possible because those experiences were always already there and you didn't want to ruin them. But the idea is the same. You want millions of people a year visiting these places without destroying them uh, and having these experiences that are necessary to their well-being. Um, and so today, I would suggest that's still true. It's just that it would be expressed in different terms. You know, we would all, uh, uh, no one wants to express them in the same aesthetic terms because they sound very elitist uh, or um, obscure, perhaps. Uh, but we do talk about, you know, E.O. Wilson and biophilia. We do talk about nature deficit disorder. There is social science evidence over the last few decades that people who live in cities, especially children, who don't have access to what we would just call nature today, we wouldn't bother calling it landscape beauty and all the judgment that that suggests, we would just say access to nature is what is, is vital to the well-being of children in cities, right? No child left behind, nature deficit disorder, so forth. I would suggest that, that, that we're talking about the same thing to a significant degree. Uh, and so the purposes and goals of, of American parks um, uh, really haven't changed, even if the language we describe them, describe those values in, um, has changed. Um, okay, Rolf, next slide. And I'm hoping to open this to discussion. I think Rolf and I both are. Um, especially with this crowd, because um, this is a very knowledgeable crowd and, and we're hoping for some tough questions. Uh, we have been fielding them most of our professional lives, I think, so I don't think that will be too much of a problem for us. Um, but this slide is just intended to suggest uh, uh, what Rolf was referring to in the report. And these kinds of statements are you know, extracted, obviously. You could extract them on your own and come up with a different set of statements. Um, but the point is, do we still believe this? Um, is, is this still important to us? Uh, is our national parks uh, really America's best idea or is, or is the whole idea of parks and the goals and purposes they have in society really the best idea? Um, uh, and, and I would suggest that these statements largely uh, characterize basic truths that, that, that still exist. Um, and that that is ultimately the justification uh, and the purposes of, of public parks, and that these kinds of statements are not limited to national parks, uh, especially large urban parks, they're just as true. Uh, and it's interesting that, that Olmsted wrote all of these sentiments um, uh, in the Yosemite report while Central Park was still under construction because they apply at Central Park as well. And I know that some of you are gonna say, but I could never have an experience in Central Park like the experience I have you know, in a national park in Yosemite Valley, say. Um, and I'll, I'll accept that, um, but I would suggest also that, um, uh, first of all, in the 19th century, that might've been less true, um, but also um, uh, it's really, if you're going to uh, uh, really experience uh, nature and have these kind of beneficial uh, uh, effects. Um, you know, go back to uh, Thoreau and uh, uh, and Gilbert White and people like that. You know, if you can't find it in your own backyard, uh, you're not going to find it uh, on a on a ten day backcountry trip either. Um, that's my sentiment anyway. I'm trying to get the crowd going, Ralph. We'll see if if uh, we do it. I'll check chat also. I think some people are starting to chime in here. Um, next slide. Oh, someone in chat just suggested that the Olmsted report was suppressed and never had any influence. That's another, Rolf and I are myth busting with this book. Um, we, we, we will read it, readily admit. Um, uh, one of them is let's just put the campfire tales behind us for a while, since um, none of them really explain the origin of the national parks or the National Park Service. Um, but the other is, yes, the, the Olmsted report from 1865 was not implemented by the state of California, as anyone who visits Yosemite Valley today can readily see, uh, but it was not, um, it did not disappear. Um, uh, it, the ideas in it um, did not disappear, and the text itself simply went back to Olmsted, who brought it to Brookline, Massachusetts, when he eventually moved there in 1883. Um, uh, and eventually um, was used, especially by Frederick Olmsted Jr. Uh, 
various times, uh, but in particular, it infused the 1916 legislation uh, that created the National Park Service. Um, uh, so the influence of the report did not disappear. Uh, it was not um, lost until 1952 when Laura Wood Roper published it. Um, it was uh, it still existed uh, in Olmsted's papers and those who had access to Olmsted papers had access to it. And, and Olmsted Jr. quotes from it verbatim a number of times. Uh, Rolf, you can clarify that. You can back me up on that one, Rolf, um, uh, when we get to discussion. But that was a good question. Thank you. Um, so it's no surprise that the fact that Olmsted, through pure serendipity, happened to be living near Yosemite Valley uh, when the grant was made, uh, uh, was asked to be chair of the commission that would plan the future of Yosemite Valley. If you can, and that's another indication of the connection between these places. Why would they ask Olmsted to plan for Yosemite Valley if they didn't think, oh, here's a park planner. Let's have him plan this park. He happens to be in California, right near Yosemite. It's a great opportunity. Why would why would it be called a park at all? And you know, and, and what did that mean? Uh, well, I think I've suggested some of the common purposes, some of the common meanings, uh, and it made perfect sense that therefore they would ask Olmsted uh, to write the 1865 report, and he went to town with it. Um, uh, he he uh, uh, really laid out the intellectual framework for a national park system in that report. It's not just limited to Yosemite, it's limited to um, all parks of at different scales. And, and he's suggesting uh, really that, that there need to be systems of these places at the national level, but also at the state, regional and urban level uh, so that people can have access um, to the kinds of scenes that otherwise would be denied to them. Um, Rolf, let's keep going and unless there are more I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat and and just get, let's move to the last slides. So Rolf and I included these last slides to be as provocative as possible. Um, no one's unmuting, but um, uh, the, the, the idea that, OK, um, first of all, the campfire myths. We can leave those behind or 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 um, perhaps people will have something to say about that. Um, uh, but the idea, you know, why are campfire tales so prevalent and have been so prevalent over the years at the Park Service? I mean, you know, Aub Aubrey Haynes discredited the 1870s story in the 1960s. It was still being interpreted in the 1980s. And only when people were forced to give that one up, they went over to another campfire with with Muir and Roosevelt. That has nothing to do with the origin of the national park idea either. I mean, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was a small child in 1864, uh, and Muir was dead by the time the National Park Service was created. And, and Roosevelt was actually against creating the National Park Service, not something people tend to forget these days. Um, Rolf, do you want to you want to chime in, or should we look at these last slides and then maybe let's make it the subject of discussion? Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, and and as Rolf was alluding to. We have to remember when these myths came about. It's the early 20th century, it's the Jim Crow era, and the National Park Service wants to get created. And to get created, it needs now Southern legislators again in Congress. And, and uh, in fact, the president was born in Virginia. So, so there is this um, uh, reconciliation between at least white people, North and South, uh, and the Jim Crow era, and there are a lot of myths being born during this period about race relations, about the Civil War. This is the era of, you know, the glamorization of the old South where things weren't really that bad. And so the idea of associating Olmsted and the Civil War with the national parks was counterproductive to creating the National Park Service. Uh, remember, Olmsted was uh, really known quite well in the 19th century as a pretty fierce critic of the old South. I mean, he, he really uncovered it uh, for what it was and reported on it in the New York Times. So so um, uh, it was not um, he was not the character and also uh, uh, national parks perhaps preferred to have an origin that was uh, pristine Western had nothing to do with Eastern cities and all the grime and the, um, uh, of Central Park. And that's something that still persists today. But I think we really need to examine these origin myths when they came about and why they came about and how important they remain to us today. Um, 
because you know when we talk about wanting more diversity in the national park system and so on if you have origin myths that are telling a different story uh, and that come out of a certain period uh, that can make it mm, shall we say difficult or contradictory Rolf, we're going to come back to this, all right? Um, so I expect you to respond, even if nobody else does. Um, next slide, and our final slide uh, as we move to discussion. This is really the best answer to the question about where um, Olmsted's Yosemite report went. It went right into that legislation. Um, it went right into the perceived purpose and goals and meanings of national parks um in the 20th century um uh and um and again uh, uh this is something that's not always recognized even though it's been pointed out repeatedly by people like Ben Rolf for 20 years or so um when the 2016 um centennial of the park service came up we suggested that really the place to celebrate it was Fairstead you know the, the Olmsted's office in, in Brookline where the legislation was written by Olmsted Jr um, it, it made a lot of sense to us, but but uh, they I guess they celebrated it in a lot of places. Did the celebration ever reach to Fairstead, Rolf? I don't know. Yeah, that I don't sounds. know either. Uh, it, it was a while ago now. All right, what else? Why don't I'm we looking uh, at comments? Yes, neither Teddy Roosevelt nor Muir were, were responsible for the national park idea. That's a little bit. That's a little bit silly, since um, uh, you know, 1864. I guess uh, where was Muir in 1864? I think he was still working in a factory in Indiana, and uh, um, Teddy Roosevelt was a small child. So, Steve, you're muted. You're muted, Steve. Before we get to uh, questions and answers, I want to thank you both and just say I'm inviting you officially to be our advisors when we work on the uh, World Heritage nomination for Central Park. I think we definitely could use your help uh, bringing out some of these ideas in the nomination dossier. <laughs> Great, we, we accept. <laughs> so I saw that my colleague uh, John Putnam has his hand up, John. Thanks, Steve, and thanks so much, Rolf and Ethan, for a really interesting uh, presentation. I'm looking forward to getting the book as soon as possible and, and going through it. Um, uh, like Steve, I'm with the International Affairs Office, so I feel like I have to ask a, an international uh, question for this presentation. And I'm, I'm curious um, to what extent you know or anyone understands any international influences on Olmsted. Was he thinking about places like Hyde Park or other urban parks in, in Europe, for example, um, when he was, uh, uh, you know, imagining Central Park and, and perhaps the national parks uh, down the road. And then the flip side of that is, um, you know, what do we know about uh, the creation of Central Park and then later Yosemite and Yellowstone um, on um, the, the creation of national parks in other parts of the world, whether it's Banff in Canada, um, Australia, you know, and not many other places soon thereafter. Um, I think I recall that Olmsted actually helped design, um, was it Mount uh, Royal in, in Montreal? So there's sort of a direct link, but I'm just curious beyond that, if you can think about sort of the, if there was much of a two-way street connection influencing Olmsted from, from overseas and likewise uh, his thoughts influencing other countries uh, park development. Miss Ethan, this is probably uh, your, your better take this, but I'd, I would just say that he was constantly influenced by what was happening, uh, in particular in in Europe, and traveled um, uh, extensively before Central Park and while he was still working on Central Park. Ethan, you're probably the best person to. Yeah, I mean, Rolf is absolutely correct. L New York wanted to be the London of North America, so the Royal Parks in London were extremely important precedents for what happens to Central Park in particular, but other European parks as well. You know, he wrote about Birkenhead, which by the way is also up for world heritage status. And they've called me and asked me because they're doing their international uh, comparison <laughs> and they want to know how much influence Birkenhead was on Central Park. And so I give them the same answer, which is um, yes, very much. And then also not at all, because what happens in the United States is something different. 
Um, and and I think I'm not going to get into all of the the whole discussion, but but um, what happens at Central Park is really different from what happens at Birkenhead in terms of design, and the implications are different in terms of the, um, how this idea in, includes the idea of preserving existing sites as well as designing a picturesque landscape. In other words, in the United States, Central Park is followed by urban park systems all over, but then also by regional park systems all over and national park system ultimately really concurrent to Central Park. If you think of the 1865 report, that's not that doesn't happen with Birkenhead, right? It's it's and, and Olmsted rejected the contemporary garden-esque design of, of Victorian Britain rather forcefully. So it's a it is a it it's the answer is yes, very much and no, not at all, perhaps or or um, uh, that's another lecture, um, but <laughs> But but um, uh, your other question was, um, and then subsequently, how much does the American park idea influence other countries? And I think you already pointed out Canada, obviously, um, and and then um, ultimately, but not till really later, you know, 20th century, um, uh, elsewhere. It's it's the, the amazing thing about the American park idea is it happens in North America, and so you have this continent to deal with, and potentially make parks out of. And that's, you know, and you just don't have that in Europe. You know, you have, uh, you know, the dispossession of indigenous people had many effects, mostly negative, right? But the idea of creating a, a, a public domain out of which you could simply set aside vast areas to be national parks and national forests, it's just not an opportunity that, it, that existed um, uh, in a lot of the world. Um, and, and so the idea of the park was allowed to take a, take root and take and, and and grow in a way in North America that it simply wasn't going to in Europe. And so that's, that's part of why, you know, people talk about it being the America's best idea, and then we could say, oh, but it's not an American idea at all. And that's true, but it but it reaches uh, a fruition here uh, and, 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 and the full implications of the idea, if you think are continental. Um, um, and that ain't, that, that's not Birkenhead, you know, that's, <laughs> <laughs> and I might just add that uh, Olmsted was co constantly aware of um, the global ramifications of what he was doing. He constantly addresses the international impact. Um, you know, and even Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address talks about. Uh, you know the the impact of the war, uh, this this nation in the context of a family of nations, and the importance of what would be a union victory, uh, not only for the United States but as an inspiration for Republican movements across the globe. I see in the comments that John Sprinkle, hi John, wants us to talk about Mather and Albright. Why, John? Hi guys. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be that skeptical graduate student who does come yeah, on. Oh yeah, we don't have enough of them in the crowd. <laughs> exactly. Let's go with that. Well, I guess I, if 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 thinking about how that influenced the two guys, and and that if this if this certainly they knew about Olmsted's reporting, right? And they're the ones that are implementing uh, the the idea. How much were they influenced? And and because we certainly can see at least with Albright influence up into the late 1970s and even beyond that. Um, so I get, were they reading Olmsted? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that, John, but I do know that uh, Albright was very attached to the um, 18, uh, 1870 campfire story. And in fact, oh, yes. part of the, as you may know, a part of the resistance to Aubrey Haynes research, he was the historian for Yellowstone, um, came from park officials who were worried about offending Albright. Albright had already retired in the 30s from the National Park Service, but as you know, he cast a, a long shadow. He's a very influential person right up until his death. So right. the Park Service wanted to protect this story in a way not to, to offend the former director. Yeah, I, I, I was just interested in that because it is such a, you know, from him, someone that's, you know, some of our colleagues that people knew, you reach back to Mather, you reach back and then perhaps back to that, you know, a century ago uh, or, or more. And I just find it interesting. I agree with you. He was very protective of the, the mythology of the park system. Um, 
I've been reading recently about stuff in the late 70s, right before the, the, the cyberling bill is put in. And he considers uh, when Bob Garvey and Bob Utley leave the Park Service to be treason. I mean, you know, how dare you leave us <laughs> kind of stuff, which, you know, OK. And he was definitely because he saw it, he was they were conspiring as part of that whole thing of taking certain part, the non park system, non park system stuff out of the Park Service. So anyway, I. It, it was interested in whether or not the uh, the founders, as it were, the found the two founders, were how influenced they were, and that, I guess that's a, a topic for further study, to say, you know, was Albright reading? Did he know? I, I, he and might have known well. about it, but I don't think he cared about it. Oh uh, um, uh, yeah. Frederick Olmsted Jr. was writing the key portion of the legislation, and of course Albright's involved, and he's and he and he, he endorses the ideas by endorsing the draft of the legislation, the 1916 legislation. But they were really invested in the idea of the national parks having it, their own origin, and right. and 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 being about Western landscapes and 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 um, being about a world of sort of white middle class adventurers, right? Um, uh, and so they wouldn't have been that interested, as no one was in the early 20th century, really, um, in a more complex story that involves, um, you know racial history and and the civil war and 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 constitutional amendments and the rest but it does and they created the mythology you know right. rather than all right they created the identity of the park service and they really were quite forceful about it and 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 um uh and i think that's interesting because part of what why ideas like in this book you know people will acknowledge them and say oh that's very interesting but they don't sink in uh, because it, it gets to the identity of the agency and and the reason people are have invested their lives in their careers and so they're not so easily uh, uh, um, uh, swayed um, um, but it's it, it, it does origin myths about an institution like the park service have a lot of implications for for um, the identity of that institution and the values of the people who you know really invest their lives in it um, uh, if you read Lee, Lee Whittlesey and Paul Shaleri wrote a book about uh, Yellowstone Campfire Story, which is quite interesting, um, you know, which is sort of a intellectual gymnastics are performed in which they say, of course, none of these things are true, but they're awfully good stories. Are we really ready to just toss them? And, and I understand where they're coming from, because uh, a really different way of understanding the significance of national parks in American society is it's not that it's threatening it just demands a, a very different understanding of of what these parks mean and that's what i meant when is the park service serious about wanting to increase diversity and wanting to really change how people think about national parks and whether they're welcome or not if they are they they probably can't cling to uh the 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 much of the identity and 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 uh, Myth making uh, that has been so important to the agency from the beginning. Yeah, we have and a I thought more that, questions. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, Ed, I thought John you also might bring up uh, my reference to reconstruction in Yellowstone. Uh, for much of my career, reconstruction was the third rail um, for the National Park Service. We couldn't get a reconstruction era site for for decades, and finally changed recently. Um, uh, you know, it's it, for that reason, same reason, the, 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 I think the, to look at, you, you can't look at Yellowstone without looking at the larger context of what was going on when that legislation went through Congress. Right. And, and very, very true. Um, I, I, as I know from one of the, my favorite stories is how we, we, the park service advisory board, at least finally decided to call it the Civil War after they realized in the 1940s that both the Congress and the Supreme Court called it that. So we were, you know, it was okay. You're anyway, okay with it then. Thanks, gentlemen. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Thanks, John. Nice to see you. I don't know if Margaret Wineland is still on. Margaret, you had a question. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, I do. I kind of wrote down my thoughts so I wouldn't lose track. I'm, I'm really interested in your um, comparison of the national parks of, of a republic like ours with the sort of ancient um, lands that belonged to nobility. They were sort of owned and monopolized by European nobility. And uh, one of the rights of the, that they reserved for themselves was to hunt the to hunt the land, to take game from that land. 
And of course, um, our national parks weren't, especially Olmsted probably did not have that in mind, but part of the, the concept of giving the land, of holding the land for the people as a, as a federal agency would be um, to allow them to hunt game. And so I just wondered if any of your research in all these years has anyone has written or talked about that. I mean, I sound like some kind of disgruntled hunter. I've actually never hunted anything, but I, I just, um, I, I wondered if that was something that was ever spoken about. Thank you. Rolf? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I don't know really what to say here. I, there, 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 there wasn't nothing that we ran across, Ethan, I think that spoke. Yeah. Uh, um, it was implicit in the idea from the beginning that there wasn't going to be hunting um, because there was going to be hunting in other places. And it's an interesting point, you know, but the hunting parks of medieval and, and early modern Europe were really quite different from what I would describe as modern parks. Um, they didn't have public access, they had different purposes, and they reserved the rights of feudal lords to, to forest resources, including game. Um, uh, and, and if you think about it, the whole meaning of park took a tremendous shift at that point um, when, when, we, when they become public and modern. And that shift is, um, you know, in the old days, they would talk about parked and paled. That's from Shakespeare. Parked and paled was not a good thing. It meant land that was reserved, the rights uh, and the resources were reserved to a feudal lord. And, and, that's, and they had draconian punishments for poaching and so on. Um, uh, and, and when we talk about making a place a park now, it is almost the opposite, right? It's, it's the resources here are for the public. Well, as we all know, the public isn't everyone and it never has been. Um, but still, it's, it's, it still seems an almost a complete reversal um, of, of, of the hunting park um, of, 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 of medieval Europe. But it's a great question. I, it made me think about it. I don't think I have a good answer. Um, Susan, Susan Dolan. Is Susan Dolan there? Hi, hey. Susan. Hey, great to see you. Too long, both of you, Rolf, nice Ethan, you. super. Um, thinking about the legacy of the NPS, sort of rooted in that idea of scenic beauty, that uh, 19th century picturesque, Olmsted Senior, embedded in the, the mission statement, 1916, to preserve conserve the scenery, et cetera. And how I think the, the agency has evolved from parks for scenery, for human well-being, to additional values of well-being, well-being for nature, well-being for Other culture. Other species. <laughs> Other species, that's right, that's right. So I, I think today, we like to think of ourselves in the National Park Service as you know, sort of you know multiple multifaceted mission, embracing certainly scenic beauty as one aspect of what we do, but certainly serving these other aspects of well-being too. And uh, when we think about cultural landscapes and parks that are set aside for cultural value, cultural identity, uh, cultural well-being, you know. Those those are obviously incredibly important, and I I'm just intrigued by the the triggers that were sort of catalysts in our evolution in the 20th century and the 21st century as an as an agency away from that central sort of a anchor of scenic beauty, and wondering how what you both feel about the influence of the Second World War on the agency. Certainly the environmental movement, the civil rights movement, really inspired an opening up of the kinds of parks that were added to the system, the kind of policies we have and what we protect. But uh, what do you think about the, the Second World War and um, what influence it had on the agency's direction? Oh. I'd bring it. Have bring anything it. else to add? That's an awfully large question. <laughs> okay. Well, I didn't want to. I didn't want to get you off than, easy, Ethan. I you know that. I'd just start a little bit earlier than the Second World War. I think the yeah. watershed for the National Park Service is the Great Depression. Yeah. And uh, the New Deal, yeah. um, where the agency, you know, more or less up to that point, was more custodial. It, it was. It saw its role as uh, taking care of. Of the of the parks that were given to it by Congress, and uh, it didn't see itself as an a a agency of social change. 
It didn't yeah. see it itself as a tool of government to sort of address national needs beyond the requirements of managing these great parks. And, uh, you know, when the, when the Roosevelt administration tasked the National Park Service um, to undertake the work with the CCC, uh, to do emergency conservation work, to partner, you know, to create, you know, when they created the historic 35 historic um, sites act, um, they were rethinking um, uh, the, and, and I might add the Parkways Act, which directed the Park Service for the first time to do national planning for rec recreational needs of the entire country. Yeah. I mean, it really took the agency from a custodial role to a national planning role. Um, yeah. That was state parks as well, right? State, state parks, parks as well. The National yeah. Park Service supervised the construction of seven hundred state parks. Yeah, yeah, extraordinary. We forget that that that, but that changed the trajectory of the National Park Service in fundamental way. In a fundamental way, it never was the same. Yes. Once yes. Congress understood that the parks could be used as a tool for social reform. They went back again and again, and you see coming out of the Parkways Act, you see the seashores. Coming out of the seashores, you see urban recreation areas. Um, that evolution was sort of set in course by, certainly by the uh, changes that occurred in the 30s. Thanks, Ralph. That's why Ralph and I work together. We, we, we agree on so many things. Hmm. What he said. I, I will point out also, Susan, you, you were sort of alluding to other species and, and, and you know, yeah. the fact that these places are necessary to human well-being doesn't matter if you're defining their purpose in terms of their necessity to other species. Um, and the Park Service has been balancing that act from the beginning, but, but especially since the 1960s. I mean, if you look at the wilderness legislation, it's defining a wilderness ideal that, in fact, is not a national park. Right. Yes. Saying what is wilderness? There are no people there. No right. roads, least, no people. Right. And at least that not is, as it was originally almost conceived. the opposite of what a yes. national park is. Yes. So, yes. so it, it ever since then, um, mm. good luck, because uh, the, 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 the Park Service has had to negotiate uh, 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 truly contradictory mandates. Not not it, we always talk about the contradiction of enjoyment and preservation as if they couldn't be accommodated together, which they can. Um, but 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 the idea of preserving for the benefit of other species and for human well-being is is I think a far deeper uh, contradiction uh, because it's either human beings are present or they are not and and, um, and and national parks you know have whatever hundreds of millions of people present at least in the front country and and um, so wilderness legislation is is really I thought Rolf is right it's the 30s when the park service really changes and and the and, and the role of parks in American society really changes but um but I think also the environmental movement has has uh, as as embodied in wilderness legislation has changed things as well um and and um it's it'll be interesting to see what the next step is you know, I think I think we've been all talking about that since 2016, at least, right? We've always talking, what's the next thing? Um, you know, when we were doing all this stuff around 2016, and we were saying, okay, Mission 66 was what it was for the 50th anniversary. It was something, at least. It was a completely new idea of how to plan and manage national parks. Do we have another one or not? And the, I think the answer was no, we don't. Uh, we'll just sort of bumble along. Sorry. Thanks, I like Ethan. to think of the uh, the concept of indicator parks that that f kind of give us a sense of what the future may bring. And uh, again, back to the uh, the 30s, the creation of Everglades was it certainly uh, could fall under the category of an indicator park for the first time, dealing with non monumental landscapes and values, ecosystem values that were not picturesque or spectacular. Uh, the, the greatest or the largest, but were had an intrinsic value that was different. Yes. Uh, and that's that certainly set us on a trajectory. And I think you know we're at an inflection point today with climate. Um, and you know how, how we how we envision uh, another tranche of parks that are going to be 
having to deal with a great deal more flexibility with some of the concepts that we have long taken for granted. And possibly the concepts of sort of cultural reconciliation potentially as well, Ralph, as a new frontier. Yes, at least as big as climate, Susan. Yeah. Bringing people together. Yeah, that's yeah. huge. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I think we probably need to end here. It's a few minutes after the hour, but I just want to say thank you again to Rolf and Ethan for a really thought provoking presentation. And um, like Jonathan, I can't wait to read the book. So I urge everyone to go out and get it. OK, can I just respond to a couple of chat comments? One was oh, about sure. Dennis Drobel's book, and I don't know because we didn't consult it while we were writing our book. We, were, we didn't even know he was writing it as far as you didn't know, right? I didn't know, Rolf. Um, and another has someone needs to write a book about NPS's role in developing state and local parks. At least two books that I can name have been written on that subject, and one of them is by me. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again, guys, and thank you sure, to Steve. everyone who joined. Thank bye you. Now. Are we all done? Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for thank coming. You. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care.